When the liberation war started, there was quite a lot of atrocities. I was at that time maybe 15, 16. I could see they would hang uh, dead bodies in poles in the cities to scare the people. Many people have died. I survived most of this, at least physically. So I also wanted uh, to have uh, a contribution. I felt an obligation that I have to do something. I regard myself as a, one of the few privileged in Eritreans. Mohamed Kier Omer, thank you for taking the time and sitting with us to talk about your new book, The Dynamics of an Unfinished African Dream. Let's get started by uh, introducing yourself to us. Tell us a little bit about who you are and where you're from. My name is Mohamed Kier uh, Omer. I grew up in Western Eritrea, and um, I had a mobile life since I was, I think, 15. So I lived in different parts of Eritrea, and then I had the opportunity to live and study also in Ethiopia, in Addis Ababa, in Sudan, at Khartoum University, and uh, also in Norway at the Norwegian School of Veterinary Sciences. I am a veterinarian by profession, but I had a very deep passion for uh, history and also very deep passion for this country called Eritrea. It has always been inside, uh, uh, inside me. So living in different places, um, has given me exposure to different cultures, different perspectives. The book is about a historical uh, journey of the people who live it in what we call Eritrea today, the different social uh, components, their um, histories. It is also uh, uh, a journey into the history of Africa. It is how it is about a country how ethnicity, religion, uh, world powers, colonialism, uh, geography have, uh, and other factors have contributed to the making of an African state. So it is both about Eritrea, it's also about Africa. Isn't it really about the struggle for independence? It is from the ancient history of Eritrea, which goes some 4000 BC to 1968. And so we have four major um, social groups in Eritrea. For example, the part that was part of the Aksumite kingdom, which was one of the strongest kingdoms of its time uh, in Africa at that time. And also the history of the Tigray Beja belt, whose history, recorded history goes to 4000 BC and then also the history of the independent Afar sultanates along the Red Sea and inland, and also about the Nilotic groups uh, called the Kunama and Nara and also other components. So it is about the history of those social components. It's also the history of, uh, in the 19, we were an Italian uh, colony. So it's also about what happened during Italian colonialism in Eritrea, the main highlights. And uh, also, we were under British administration from 1941 to 1952. And it was a very vibrant uh, period. Uh, we had about more than 10 political uh, parties. Then uh, in 1952, became federated um, to Ethiopia. And this federal arrangement gave us really a very democratic um, constitution. Uh, that was far more advanced than the imperial Ethiopian constitution. So there was freedom of uh, press, freedom of um, gathering, and it was based on the United Nations principles. And so from 1952 to 1962, we were under uh, this uh, federation, which was being eroded gradually by the Ethiopian uh, government. And uh, in 1961, Eritreans waged the, uh, one of the longest uh, armed liberation movements in Africa. So it's also about this period from 1961 to 1968. Uh, so in part, the book is also 
about me and about the Eritrea inside in me. Because, for example, when I look at the um, ancient history, I belong to this Beja Tigre belt, so it is about also history of mine. When I look at Italian colonialism, also my grandparents were originally nomads. They were inscripted, like many Eritreans of the time, into the Italian army. Interestingly enough, uh, when, while digging into these uh, uh, records, I found a small boy about my grandfather from my material, maternal side, that he was one of those uh, mentioned, nine, one of those 19,000 who were, who were mentioned as to have uh, got uh, medals. So it's also partly, as I say, in me. In the 1940s, uh, my uncle, uh, Mohammed Abdullah, was one of the uh, leaders of the Italo-Eritrean party or the new Eritrea party. And uh, then from 1961 on onwards, uh, my hometown was almost a center of the liberation movement in the beginning. So I was also a personal witness. So it is, it goes, it is about the history of Eritrea, uh, about the Eritrea in me, about myself, about the people of Eritrea. Maybe you gave a partial answer to this previously, but why, in fact, did you write this book? Actually, I, I, I wrote the book because, uh, first of all, I, 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 as I have said, I had a very deep passion in history. I would like love to learn uh, history, to know more about Eritrean um, history. And also, I regard myself, I was one of the privileged few who survived most of these adversaries to which Eritreans were subjected before independence and also after independence. I had the chance to get higher education. So this opened up opportunities for me. I also speak several languages, two of the main Eritrean languages, Tigrinya and Tigrayit, and also Amharic, Arabic, English, and also learned Norwegian when I, while I was in Norway. So this gives me a, a, a vast resource I can I can uh, browse on to write the, the history. So what I found out was that the history, most of the books of the Eritrean, on, on particularly they miss this ancient history part. For example, there is a lot written about the Aksumite um, uh, kingdom, empire, but not much about the Beja Tigre belt, about the Kunama and Nara, about the Afar sultanates. Uh, so I thought I would fill that gap in a way. And also I found that uh, people usually use, I have written, I have seen books, for example, written in Arabic. So they just use Arabic sources. I have seen some use English. They use maybe English and Tigrinya. So I couldn't find many books that are as comprehensive as, uh, as this one. So I thought this could be a contribution. At least I can have a different narrative, um, a narrative that not necessarily is absolute truth, but a narrative that will uh, generate a discussion on Eritrean history and enrich in its er Eritrean history. So this was my main idea behind why I wrote the book. As you say, there are books that have been written uh, drawing on individual sources, maybe from in, in a particular language or from a particular point of view. Uh, but what your book seems to do is gather more sources from different ethnic groups, different languages, and uh, seems to draw a more comprehensive picture of Eritrea, the history, and the, and the people. Is that, is that a fair statement? Yes. Uh, actually, uh, that was uh, the case because... Um, these books, I, I find them, they depend mainly on some language sources, specific language course, uh, sources. But I had that advantage of being able to speak several languages. So I have used very, very wide sources uh, in different parts of the history of uh, Eritrea. So I think that will be a contribution in itself, but also of course, I'm a veterinarian, and to write a book about history was not easy for a veterinarian to write a book about history. And also, I wanted the book to be comprehensive, but at the same time concise, because I feel like we live in a Twitter generation now. You have this, for example, one minute feed, um, five minutes feed, etc. the major news resource, because people, I don't think they read as, as they did in the past. So it was to make it concise and uh, comprehensive and the task was not easy particularly to summarize this ancient history of Eritrea which is quite uh, quite rich because as I've said uh, 
We have written scripts, which are which is one of the oldest in Africa, which is called um, Giz. Also, there are a million old uh, human skulls have been found in um, the Red Sea area of um, Eritrea, and the first human settlements were in, the, in those in that region. So. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of archaeological findings that have not been really uh, dug because of the war and because we had a repressive regime afterwards. So there is a lot to be discovered in uh, Eritrea. I want to go back to um, your previous answer. You said that you had been through, you'd survived certain situations uh, in Eritrea. And, 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 I'm, and I'm wondering, did you feel an obligation to or a commitment to tell this story? Yes, absolutely true, because um, we've passed through many atrocities. For example, during, uh, yeah, we, during the Italian colonial period, there were about 60,000 Eritreans who fought in the, Eritrean, in the, in the Italian colonial uh, army. We don't know their names, except few. We don't know their faces. We don't know how many of them died, if they were compensated or, uh, or not. And... Uh, then during this period of uh, self-determination under the British rule from 41 to 52, um, actually Ethiopia was claiming Eritrea as its part and was supporting one of the parties in Eritrea. So the people were almost divided in those between those who wanted to have an independent country and those who wanted to be part of Ethiopia. So there was a lot of Ethiopian influence. And when the liberation war uh, started, there was quite a lot of atrocities, for example, um, I was at that time maybe 15, 16, I can see they would hang uh, dead bodies in poles in the cities to scare the people. They would drag and we always live it in fear. For example, when I was even in the secondary school, I remember uh, we, we, we didn't have electricity, so we used lamps and uh, because um, the uh, army would control see if there is a house which is lit, for example, mid in the night, they could come and ask you what you are doing. So for that reason, I had to use a torch under uh, a blanket um, to read. That is one of the things I remember. But many people have died. Many people have been disabled, etc. But I, I survived most of this, um, at least physically. So. I also wanted uh, to have uh, a contribution. I felt an obligation that I have to do something. As I said, I was, I, I regard myself as a, one of the few privileged Eritreans. These atrocities you mentioned, these are by the Eritrean government of the day? By the Ethiopian government. government of Haile Selassie. Under Haile Selassie, yes. It's clear you have great love for Eritrea, but you've been refugeed twice in your life, is that right? Can you talk about that? Yes, I was a refugee in 1975 after uh, the, um, the coming up of the Dergi in Ethiopia in 1974. And the repression increased against Eritreans because they would have Eritrea by, by force. And so a lot of people, um, there was a second wave of, uh, of refugees, the first wave in 1967 when the Serbians used the scorched air Air's policy. So uh, the first uh, refugees were in 1967 who went to Sudan. So I, I was in Sudan from 1975 to, you can say, 1991. But during that period, I also active, for example, I was uh, one of the leaders of the Eritrean student uh, movements and I was political active. But that was one period of my being a refugee and uh, also worked at the Sudanese uh, Refugee Commission uh, during that period, so I worked with uh, refugees. And the second one was in 19, in 2001. In 2000, we were a group of academicians, 13 of us, uh, who wrote an open letter to the president. It was unprecedented. It was the first time that such an open letter be written. And it was all over the media in uh, Eritrea, and we called for democratic reforms, uh, reforms and we criticized the president for conducting the war with uh, Ethiopia uh, in uh, 1998. Uh, and uh, so uh, I was with, with that group. And I was one of two who were inside Eritrea at that time. The others were abroad. So the other friend of mine left, so I was the only one there. 
And I left in uh, 2001. We had a collaboration project with the Norwegian Veterinary School because I was uh, then uh, teaching at the University of uh, Asmara. I left Eritrea and after that in September 2001, all those who called for democratic reforms were arrested. So I was lucky enough not to have been at home, so I couldn't turn back. So I ended up as a refugee in uh, Norway. So were you a member of the uh, Eritrean Liberation Front? Yes, I was a member of the ELF because uh, ELF was the only organization until 1968. The Liberation Front started in 1960 when the Ethiopians started dismantling the, free, the Federation piece by piece. For example, they uh, lowered down the Eritrean flag, they stopped using Eritrean languages, which were two official languages, Tigrinya and Arabic, and they started using Amharic, and the repression increased. So. Uh, returns when they exhausted all means of peaceful um, struggle, so they started this armed struggle. And it was, the beginning it was around my hometown, was uh, one of the major towns in the area. So there were confrontations during that period of time, and there was a very big uh, repression. As I said, people hung on balls for days. I've never seen something like this. And um, I remember during that time we had uh, Peace Corps teachers in my hometown in Agora. I remember one time uh, there were uh, the Serbians would kill even civilians and hang them on poles. And so this uh, Peace Corps teacher wanted to take a photo. So he almost uh, took us there, but he, like he was looking at something else, he took a photo of the uh, people hanged on on uh, on the uh, on the poles. So, but this repression actually forced more and more people to go. And uh, I could have joined uh, the, uh, the armed struggle then. I had uh, only my only brother. So he had uh, gone and joined the liberation struggle. And so at that time, they were not taking. Um, if you were the only, for example, brother or something, so they won't take you for uh, to, to fight in the army. So that, that's why I didn't go and uh, join the LF at uh, that period. Mohamed, so the title of the book, The Dynamics of an Unfinished African Dream, what exactly does that mean? The title of uh, The Dynamics of an Unfinished African Dream, Eritrea, Ancient History to 1968, is actually about the dream of having a democratic, just, uh, inclusive Eritrea that respects human uh, rights. Uh, Eritrea that is at peace with itself first and at peace with others. So it is this dream, and I think it is true in many African countries. Still, they have this dream uh, in many African countries. Uh, so it, it is about this dream, my dream. It is not finished yet. Yes. We are still struggling for a democratic uh, government. Uh, dictatorships cannot prevail. Change uh, definitely uh, comes. It is just a matter of time because uh, dictatorship is just going against the tide of history. So definitely the dream will be true. Whether I will uh, outlive that dream or it comes after I pass away, I don't know, but I'm sure that, that the dream will be fulfilled. Well, it may be inevitable, but dictatorships do last a long time. Yes, that is true. That is true. They can last for a long time, but uh, still um, there is a time where they will go. And I think the trend is now for democracy, for democratic governors in Africa. It may take a while, but it will come. So how much of the book is historical research and how much is your personal memoirs, experiences? As I've said in the beginning, it is um, mainly based on um, historical um, research, and uh, but it also uh, it's also about my own experiences reflected in it. Uh, for example, as I've said when talking about the history, so it's also part of I'm part of that history. When I talk about the Italian period, my grandparents were in the Italian army, and um, in the forties also, as I've said, I had also an uncle who was one of the leaders of political parties in Eritrea. So it is about it is a journey. Also, it is about Eritrea. It is about the Eritrea inside me and um, the self me and about Africa also. So what is it that people should know about the book and what is it that they should learn from it? 
I think people um, take what they uh, want from a book and they could interpret it in a different way and focus on something uh, take away from it. But uh, I think what I, I hope is that people will get a new perspective into Eritrean history and, and looking at it in uh, a different way, um, a different perspective, a different uh, narrative. And uh, I hope that it also will generate debate uh, because um, history cannot be just be written by victors of a, a one liberation army or something. It is a, a long process. And the problem we have Eritreans today is that uh, uh, we don't, each one of us looks at, the hist- at Eritrea from his own angle, from his own ethnicity or from his own history and negate the other parts. We, we, we need to look into... Uh, we need to accept all these histories, the different histories I was talking about, as they belong to me. For example, I am a Muslim, but as an Eritrean, Christianity also defines part of my identity. I speak a particular language in Eritrea, but all other languages also define my identity. Even the traditional beliefs define my identity. Uh, that is what I would like people to learn from this, that we need to, to um, accept all these different histories as our own. We need to look at it not from a particular ethnicity, a prism of ethnicity or religion or whatever, but we look at Eritrea as, as a whole, with all its components and parts. So do you think that has held Eritrea back, these uh, pockets of ethnicity that you're talking about? I think it has been a problem uh, in Eritrea among Eritreans because they are still divided, for example, in the 19... 19- 40s, 50s, we were divided uh, because some wanted to be part of Ethiopia, as others who didn't have any history with Ethiopia. They wanted to be um, independent. And then uh, when we started the liberation war, we were divided because we had two main uh, liberation organizations. That was also based on these different aspects of uh, history, culture, language, uh, religion, etc. And also the Eritrean opposition is very much divided today. We have something like 34 or something organizations. And I see these elements in in, in all of them. So I I see the way forward is to embrace this totality called Eritrea, this beautiful mosaic called Eritrea, with all its components, with all its histories. Uh, So it it has been a problem uh, for us Eritreans. You go back a long way in Eritrean history in this book. Is it fair to say that you can't understand the present if you don't know about your past? It's, it's absolutely true. We can't, uh, if we want to understand the present, we need to look into the past. There is a saying that says, for example, history repeats itself. But as they say, history doesn't repeat itself. It is the people who make the same mistakes again and, uh, and again. So history is a very important uh, mechanism for us to understand the present and also to look into the future. So I hope my book will be a small contribution in that aspect. It strikes me that the English-speaking world really doesn't know a lot about Eritrea, that perhaps it's been overshadowed by uh, other parts of Africa. And I'm wondering, um, with this book, where you're bringing all these sources to bear in the, in the English language, was it your intention to try to make a contribution um, in the English-speaking world to, to bring Eritrea really to English speakers? Yes, also we had a problem with certain uh, Western scholars, most of them. I think uh, Professor Shetter Trovor also clearly states in his foreword that uh, people use it to come to Eritrea and take information from only one side, maybe one group of these groups I was talking about, one liberation movement, n- not from all. So m- most of the things written in Western books, most of them, not all, there have been very objective researchers like uh, Shetil, like uh, Gunther Schroeder and others. Uh, they have just been taking information from one side or one group and reflecting that side, which had also a negative impact on, on, on Eritrea. So uh, my narrative also challenge, challenges these, uh, these um, perceptions about Eritrea. So the book takes us up through 1968. Why did you stop in 1968? And I understand that you've got more coming, though, in a, in a future book. Is that right? Yes, I'll have the second part. I stopped at 1968 because uh, 1968 was a milestone in Eritrean history. It was 
the culmination of uh, struggle between those forces who wanted to maintain the status quo in the ALF, it had many problems, and those who wanted to reform it from inside, and those who wanted to form their own organization, who thought that um, the ALF is not repairable, so they could form. So it, this struggle was at its highest at that period of time. Another um, um, fact is also we had many people, uh, many fighters who were trained in China, Cuba, um, Syria, some other Arab countries who started to come back to Eritrea in 1968, coming with new ideologies, new ideas, and um, more intellectuals started to join the struggle. Uh, so that is in that fact important. Another very important fact is that the ALF existed as one organization until 1968. So I wanted to stop at uh, that point in uh, history because that is an important milestone. My second book will be from 1968 to modern times. And in this book also, I give an insight into, we had two clandestine parties inside the, um, the ELF and the EPLF. And uh, so I have, I've given a short summary of who they are, what they were, etc. on this book. So uh, I hope I'll be working on the second part. Sitting here in 2020, are you optimistic about Eritrea? Yes, I've always been optimistic. I'm really very optimistic because, as I've said, there is nothing permanent. There is always change, and the change will be for the better. It is just a matter of time, so I feel really very optimistic about Eritrea. What's the one important thing, the takeaway that people have to know about this book? In my book, for example, I use the sources. Um, for example, there are very ancient uh, Arabic sources about Eritrea, about the history of uh, Eritrea that you don't see reflected in of these English books. Uh, people have written, for example, about the history of this Aksumite empire where it was made up of southern Eritrea and northern uh, Ethiopia. And uh, people have written about the Afar as an entity. Uh, maybe they have written about the Kunama and the Nara. But uh, I think and I hope that my book covers all that was missing. For example, when we study about the ELF, there are a lot of resources in Arabic that I have uh, used in this uh, book. So I think for researchers, for those interested to know about uh, Eritrea, I think definitely each one will find something different. If one has read a book in Arabic, he will find something in English. If one uses mainly Tigrinya, he will find something in Arabic. Or if one is just Arabic, he will find something in, written in Tigrinya, in Amharic. And it was objective, I will say, because I've used Ethiopian sources and uh, local sources, uh, some new sources and books written by the leaders of the ELF. So I feel it will be a contribution, but I think I, I leave this judgment to the readers. Thank you, Mohammed, for sitting and talking to us today about your new book. We wish you great success.